Hey everybody, hope you're all doing well. My name is Steven and this is the Storytime channel. Today we have some pro revenge stories and our first story of the day is by KTB1962. Try to cut the line? Sure, you can go before me when I'm next. Before COVID hit, my wife and I loved to cruise. 12 cruises in and very few problems. Unfortunately, many people feel they're far more important than anyone else, especially when it comes to the line at the purser's guest services desk. Everyone has just one question, so some try to circumvent the line, as was the case with one very self-entitled woman. The line was about eight or nine people deep and I was third in line. Little miss, I'm so important, tried to talk her way to being first, but the guy was having nothing to do with it. She tried to get the guy who was second to allow her in and she was starting to get all whiny and confrontational about how important her question is. She then came to me and asked to cut ahead of me. Normally I would have said no way, but looking back and seeing the length, I knew what I was going to do. I said, sure, just let me get to the head of the line, then you can go ahead of me. She gleamed and said thank you while standing there with a smug look on her face. She won. Guy in front of the line moved up, I'm now second. At this moment I turned to the guy behind me and offered him to cut ahead of me, making me third again. Little miss, I'm so important, saw this and asked why I did this. I said, I'm in no hurry, so I let him go next. She huffed but said nothing else. I did that four more times before she caught on to what I was doing and screamed at me to immediately allow her in the line. I said, you better ask everyone behind me if they'd mind. By now, the line had more than 10 people behind me. One voice behind me said, no freaking way. Her jaw dropped and knowing that she had been beat, she slinked to the back of the line. When I finally got to the desk, the person behind it congratulated me for a job well done. I also got a $200 onboard credit for what I did. Even with that, it was so worth it to put someone in their place. So if you found yourself in this line, would you be the kind of person to just say no flat out? Or would you want to do something like OP and try and waste their time for trying to cut ahead of all these people? Or would you have just let them skip you? Let me know in the comments down below. This next story is by Champion5. Damage my TV in transit and deny the claim? No more shipments for you. Ten years ago, I moved for my job. I had forgot about one of my TVs back home and asked my dad to ship it to me, on my company's account since they paid for my move. A couple days later, the delivery driver from the shipping company A drops it off. The box was heavily damaged, so I didn't sign for it. He waited while I plugged it in and, to no one's surprise, it was damaged. He said that he could take it back if I didn't want to sign for it and the shipper could file the claim. I informed him I was the shipper and would file it here. This was a small mistake, but I've shipped thousands of parts through this company so I figured it wouldn't be a problem. Claim denied a month later. This goes back and forth for a couple months with multiple emails to this old lady and she didn't care at all. She was also very rude to me via email and phone. Now, this shipping company A has two separate entities, Parcel and Freight. We solely use this freight company for all of our warehouses across the US. I cut them off at my new store and started using company B. It only took a month before the salesman from shipping company A stopped by. When he showed up and asked why he was losing $20,000 worth of freight a month, I informed him of the $600 broken TV from his sister company a couple months back. He said that he couldn't do anything about it since it was the separate side of their company and begged for the business back. No dice. This goes back and forth for several months. Our average was about $20,000 to $25,000 a month they would bill us for and it was a small town so they were very upset that it was only over a $600 TV. I got a check in the mail about a year after I shipped the TV along with a letter from their vice president. So I guess this is the pro part. Fast forward a couple years and I've been promoted within the company to make certain decisions and one happens to be logistics. None of our locations use shipping company A. Some months we spend well over 100 grand, but most are around $80,000 company wide. And this has been going on for several years now. We also inform customers to use shipping company B since shipping company B is awesome and treats us very well. Since about 2011, we have used them countrywide. 
no telling how much shipping company A lost over a $600 TV. This is all a great big matter of principle. If they're going to go and screw even the smallest of guys over over a TV, why would you want to be in business with that shipping company? Especially when it negatively affects somebody that they do a great deal amount of business with. Even though it's a $600 TV, it's a matter of principle and a matter of pride. Obviously, they didn't want that money hard enough because there's no way that they just couldn't do anything about it. There's always somebody you can escalate that kind of a situation to, even if it has to go to the tippy top, which in this case, it went all the way to the vice president. But way too little, way too late. Our next story is by Thomas of Hookton. Reuse unfinished soups for the next customer? Lose your restaurant. This revenge story happened in the 90s when I was working after school as a line cook slash chef's assistant at a Chinese restaurant. The place specialized in noodle soups, with the main attraction being our soup stock. The owner used a much revered passed down family recipe. It consisted of freshly cracked pork bones, fresh spices and fresh vegetables all kept at a rolling boil for over 12 hours. It had to be started the night before and the owner was very particular about the soup stock. If it ran out, then it ran out. He refused to cheat as some places do by adding water or powdered stock, etc. The owner himself was this really awesome old Chinese gentleman. He had some incredible stories. For example, he enlisted into the Kuomintang, Chinese Republic Army, in the 40s and worked as a chef for KMT officers during World War II. He told us about how one time his division's HQ was overrun and he had to escape on a push bike ahead of the advancing Japanese army. Eventually, when the Chinese Communist Party took over in the 50s, he was assigned to a steel factory to work for the rest of his life. He got the freak out of there and eventually made his way to the US as an asylum seeker. I digress, but my point is that he was an awesome guy and was a genuinely kind and considerate boss. He always made sure his employees were fed before the evening shift and let me study during quiet nights. His son, on the other hand, was a real piece of crap. This guy dropped out of college, his parents saved up for him to study medicine after two years. He floated in and out of jobs but mostly stayed unemployed, living with his parents and using their money to well into his mid-30s. He eventually started working at the restaurant, nominally as the front of house manager, but in reality did nothing but watch TV and take naps. While I was only a line cook, the old man and I got along really well. He trusted and would routinely get me to make the soup stock the night before under his supervision. Sadly, the old man died after my fifth year working there. That's when the son took over. The mother had passed years ago. The son had zero cooking experience but decided to take over as the chef. He didn't like the idea of putting the soup on overnight, waste of gas, and instead got me to do the prep the night before and then would just switch the pot on himself in the morning. He would also routinely add plain water to the soup when it got low, so he could continue selling noodle soups. The most incredible thing, however, was disgustingly, he got the waitstaff to throw customers' unfinished soups back into the stockpot for reuse. When I confronted him about it, he told me that it was no problem as the heat killed any germs, and threatened to fire me if I said anything. Not surprisingly, customers started leaving as the food quality degraded. This caused the son to panic and cut even more costs. He fired most of the old staff and thus overworked the remaining. He couldn't fire me because I was the only one left who knew how to do the soup. He also stopped using quality ingredients and started to buy cheap pre-packaged stuff in order to reduce my prep work hours. After a few months of this, I got sick of his crap. As I was about to start college myself, I told him that I was giving him my notice. He of course took this poorly and told me that I was a loser. He told me to not bother coming in tomorrow, but I was to spend the remainder of my shift showing a recent hire on how to do my job, stating that he would not issue my last check if I didn't complete a thorough handover. I laughed in his face and walked out on the spot. I didn't bother chasing up my last check. As a parting gift, I sent an email to our local food safety board informing them of the poor sanitary practice and reusing leftover soups. 
I helpfully also enclosed a few photos that I had sneakily taken of the practice. The board sent inspectors the very next day and closed the restaurant. There were other issues as unhygienic bathrooms and uncleaned eating utensils. He was issued a massive fine and a list of undertakings to carry out before it could be reopened. The restaurant remained closed and was eventually sold off. I didn't bother chasing up what happened to the son, but I hope he has learned his lesson and done something productive with his life. I love that in the comments of this reddit post, OP actually included the exact recipe on how to make the soup stock. That said, it's totally unfortunate that the son took over and drove the dad's hard work straight into the ground, but at least the dad didn't have to witness it happen. There will always be a lasting written legacy knowing exactly what the dad did and achieved, and you can always look at that proudly separating it from what happened after they were gone. In fact, in a way, I think it only adds more to the legacy of the father. Our next story is by Mies Calden. Upstairs neighbor decided to watch a loud action movie at 3 a.m. When my wife and I got married, our first apartment was in a house that had been subdivided into four units, two upstairs, two downstairs. The basement had a coin-operated washer and dryer that all the tenants shared. By chance, our apartment had the indoor basement stairs. All the other tenants needed to use the outdoor stairs to access the basement. One night, the neighbors directly above us decided to watch an action movie at 3 a.m. Loud explosions, rock music soundtrack, gunfire sounds, everything. I'm a plumber, and I have worked in the construction trades for more than a decade, so I understand how most residential construction works. I knew each apartment had its own electric service. So I walked downstairs and flipped their main breaker off, killing all power to their apartment and none to anyone else. Counted to 30 and it turned back on again, then went upstairs and fell asleep in my now peacefully quiet bedroom while all their appliances and electronics rebooted. Worked like a charm. To be fair, I feel like most people should be aware that a circuit breaker is a thing. That said, living in an apartment, you might not automatically think circuit breaker. You'd probably just think that there's some kind of apartment-wide issue regardless. And it was 3 a.m., so they probably wouldn't be able to tell either way. This next story is by Mike, underscore, ox on fire. Don't be rude to parking enforcement. This happened about a decade ago to a family friend. The cast, a parking enforcement officer, P.E., his boss, P.B., and an unpleasant, rude, entitled driver, E.D. Parking enforcement officer is working in a car park, checking cars aren't taking up two spaces, ticketing cars that have overstayed, etc. He's just ticketed a car that is parked over two spaces, and in which the ticket displayed was no longer valid. It's a pay and display car park, and you purchase a ticket for a number of hours. Entitled driver appears, sees parking enforcement officer near his car, and runs up to it. Upon seeing the enforcement ticket, he asks parking enforcement officer what it is for, and is told it's for overstaying in the car park and parking across two bays. Entitled driver gets angry and starts swearing at parking enforcement officer. What the freak do you think you're doing? Do you know who I am? You freaking a-hole, and so on. Parking enforcement officer doesn't have time for this attitude and tells entitled driver to just freak off, will you? Entitled driver is too shocked to respond, so he huffs and gets in his car and drives off. Later on, as parking enforcement officer finishes his working day and he's back in the office, he's called into his boss's office. Boss says he has an irate customer on the phone, on hold, who's complaining about how the enforcement officer has told him to freak off. Boss says, is this true? And parking enforcement officer has the opportunity to give his side of the story. Boss says, right, I'll just finish the conversation with the customer and I'd like you to wait here in my office. Boss goes back into the call and says to entitled driver, well, I've just spoken to the enforcement officer in question and I think, given the fact that you were very abusive towards him first, that on balance, it's only fair if you just freak off and ended the call. Parking enforcement officer wasn't in trouble. If I was that parking enforcement officer, you don't know how smug I would be feeling having stood there watching the boss echo exactly what I said to that entitled driver. 
And our final story of the day is by Maxilon, the best way to deal with high beams in your mirrors. This is from 20 years ago. Preamble, I was living in a country area where the road was shared between normal cars and agricultural vehicles of all sorts. Farmers often contract out the spraying of their crops and the contractors often use utes, trucks with all sorts of lights. These lights are said to illuminate a boom sprayer at nighttime. Boom sprayers are often 20 to 30 meters wide. This means they are basically 8 plus spotlights at all angles to illuminate a 50 meter wide path. So they don't hit things because that's how wide the sprayer is. That is a lot of light. Story. I was driving down the highway at night with some traffic. Nothing crazy. One lane each way. There is a ute ahead of me and a small car behind. The small car is in a big rush and passes me as soon as they can. They pull up to maybe 20 meters behind the ute, and for whatever reason, they hit the high beam and don't turn it off. At first, I figure it's an accident. After a few seconds, I'm not so sure. After 5 seconds, the ute activates its defenses and turns on the rear lights. Night turned to day in an impressive fashion. I was about 500 meters back and I was impressed at the lumens. The small car smashed the brake pedal and promptly flicked the low beam. For the next 20 kilometers, until the small car could pass normally, they hung back at a normal distance with respectable lights. Not much, but I giggled. To be fair, who likes to be driving at night and have that jerk behind you with the high beams on practically blinding you? A lot of times you feel like you can't even see the road when that kind of stuff happens. So it kind of worked out perfectly that this ute had the ultimate defense against this high beam sinner. I'd probably have been petty and done the same thing. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. So if you have a favorite story of the day, let me know which story and why in the comments down below. But besides that, if you enjoyed the video, please consider giving it a like. And if you haven't, subscribe and turn notifications on so you'll never miss an upcoming video. No matter what you do, whether it's just viewing the video, liking, subscribing, turning notifications on, I appreciate the heck out of it. Every little thing that you do helps the channel grow that much more and I can't thank you enough for it. So, until next time, I hope you all have a wonderful day, and I'll be right here next time on the Storytime channel.